Before us opens the landscape of a highly developed city, where one of the architectural dominants is a skyscraper with a modern extravagant roof, a building that serves as the office of the Dingyan Corporation. At the top of this office, in the presidential office, an interview takes place with Mr. Liu, the man who made the very existence of this corporation possible, and the interviewer notes that he is the richest businessman among China's young financial elite. Considering that Mr. Liu built his business, a giant corporation, from scratch, without much capital, the journalist asks a fairly common question in such cases, wondering how exactly the businessman was able to reach such heights. Mr. Liu, a guy of about 25 to 30 years old, most likely expected such a question, so without wasting too much time on thinking, he answers in his usual manner. The young businessman, in a serious, albeit somewhat simple tone, claims that he managed to find the secret key to great wealth, a secret that simplifies the process of becoming a rich person, minimizing big risks. With great enthusiasm and enthusiasm in her eyes and movements, the interviewer, realizing that she could receive exclusive material from such an interesting person, immediately asked for more information about this secret, perhaps some advice for other young entrepreneurs. However, of course, everything could not be expressed so simply, the head of the Dingdian Corporation replies that the secret of his success is called a secret precisely because it should not be revealed to others if he does not want to harm himself and his own business. Realizing this and easily accepting her failure at the opportunity, the interviewer decided to change the subject by asking about the young businessman's future plans, given his stellar achievements already at such an early age. Mr. Liu, the whole head of the Dingdian Corporation, rejects the journalist's praise and claims that what he has is not enough for him, and his achievements are barely noticeable compared to his larger goal for his career. The interviewer was somewhat surprised by such a speech, too modest for people like this young businessman so she decides to ask directly what kind of global goal is at the basis of all his decisions, and what he wants to achieve. In the same simple and serious tone as throughout the conversation, the young businessman claims that from the very beginning of his career he had only one single goal. With his index finger raised, as if in an awkward attempt to draw attention to his words, the head of the corporation claims that his life's desire and goal is to reach the pinnacle of his business career. The interviewer was in shock for several seconds, as if trying to comprehend what exactly this influential businessman means by the pinnacle of a businessman's career, given that he is already the head of a corporation, but suddenly the journalist understands and asks again in great surprise. The young head of the corporation, in a somewhat frivolous tone for him, with a barely noticeable smile, confirms the journalist's guesses, saying that the pinnacle of a career for any entrepreneur is being the wealthiest person in the world. Suddenly, the short and somewhat tense silence between the businessman and the interviewer is interrupted by a light knock on the office door, most likely one of Mr. Liu's subordinates has something to say. A young girl wearing a typical office uniform and with her long brown hair flowing, apologized for disturbing her boss and quickly entered the office. The influential businessman subordinate informed everyone present that according to the planned schedule, the time allotted for Mr. Liu's interview had already passed and she should begin her other duties. Hearing this, the young corporate head responded approvingly to this message and stood up, thus signaling the end of this interview session and ordering the journalists to leave his office in a polite manner. However, suddenly a sharp and powerful pain rang through the extravagant entrepreneur's body, causing her to barely stand, holding her chest with her hand and expressing her pain through a poorly hidden grimace on her face. For a few seconds, the young businessman began to lose consciousness, everything around him turned into only fuzzy outlines of objects and people, the journalist noticed that the man was not feeling well, so she tried to call out to him, but when she saw that he was falling, she began to panic. Suddenly, the head of the corporation found himself in a ghost state, shining with a blue light, he silently and somewhat shocked watched as his employees fussed around his body, calling security, an ambulance and trying to give him first aid. A young businessman sees his already dead body being lifted by his subordinates, apparently planning to take him to the lower floors so that the ambulance does not waste unnecessary important time getting to a patient in critical condition. With some misunderstanding, the man, or rather the spirit, the immortal soul watching over his own corpse, came to the conclusion that this was the end of the life of this super-influential entrepreneur who had bold goals, but could not achieve them. Behind this newfound spirit, unnoticed by any living person in this room, a sudden answer of approval sounded, confirming his guesses about his current state, 
about sudden death and subsequent reincarnation. Turning around, the young entrepreneur noticed behind him a girl in an ancient outfit, not far from rags in her condition, with a rope in her hand, she argued that usually mortals, when dying, are too frightened to understand their own situation. This girl was most likely one of the many guides of mortals, she strangely took the rope in her hands in such a way as to draw attention to it and semi-playfully asked that since the guy understood everything, she wouldn't need it, to which he immediately changed the subject, asking about the causes of death. She easily answers that the reason is quite simple and banal, he died from oversaturating his body throughout his life and over the last five days the businessman constantly stayed up until the dead of night, which increased the risks, to which the guy replies that he thought, that his body could handle something like that. The businessman looked at his body again and, in his usual manner, turned to the conductor, asking for a deal of a certain kind, in which he would return him to life, at least for a short period, at any cost acceptable to him. The conductor, in a somewhat solemn tone, replies that she could not leave him in this state, since the owner of hell needs the soul of a businessman already at five o'clock, and it is not in her professional habits to violate this sacred schedule, despite her changing nature. Having finished her short speech, the conductor opens a large portal in blue and purple tones, leading to the afterlife, at the same time she says that if the guy has any questions, he can ask them on the way to the ruler of hell. The girl, in a simple and familiar tone, orders the young guy's soul, freed from the body, to follow her through a grandiose portal to the goal of their journey, the court of the infernal ruler. However, the spirit of the young businessman still lingers for a while in his office, examining things that are dear and valuable to him, the table at which so many crazy negotiations were held and so many brilliant ideas were voiced, the doors through which the most famous and closest people came to his office. Unfortunately, no one can resist death for long, realizing this, the spirit of an influential young businessman bids farewell to his office with this brief contemplation and several reminiscences from different times and finally decides to enter hell through a strange portal. Together with the guide, the spirit of Mr. Liu passes through beautiful red fields covered with radiant lycoris, an ancient symbol of the kingdom of death, it seems that only these flowers are the only source of light here in the midst of the eternal cold darkness of the hellish dimension. The young entrepreneur looks around with a certain interest and asks the conductor whether the road to the other world is really there, to which he receives a short, albeit somewhat patronizingly approving answer. The girl, in a somewhat playful tone, advises the spirit to enjoy this beautiful landscape of brilliant crimson radiant lycoris, since when the hellish trial over him is completed, he will begin his life again without memories of the beauty of this place. However, the spirit of the young businessman only in a simple mournful tone mourns the fact that he did not have time to achieve the goal of his just lost life, promising himself that if some memory still remains with her in the next life, then he must make more efforts to realize the goal, into reality. However, suddenly a quiet and calm journey through the hellish fields is interrupted by a scream from behind the guide and spirit, the cry of a girl who anxiously calls someone named Xiao Bai and hastily approaches the guide and spirit. Subsequently, the spirit is able to notice that this girl is the same guide through the other world, wearing the same uniform as his own guide, only in slightly different colors, and he also comes to the conclusion that Xiao Bai is the name of his guide. When this girl finally reached them, catching her breath from probably too much sudden physical exertion, Xiao Bai, the conductor in a white outfit, asks what exactly caused her to run so much, while the spirit of the entrepreneur only watched the stranger. The black-robed girl, still having trouble breathing after her run, states in a vague tone that the conductor had captured the wrong soul, apparently implying that the businessman's spirit was yet to live on. This information causes a certain shock and necessary time to rethink the information for both Xiao Bai, the guide in white, and the guy whose soul was mistakenly sent to these crimson fields, but of course, the overall atmosphere was quite awkward. The spirit of the young businessman understands that the situation in front of him is quite extraordinary, and therefore decides to ask his guide again what exactly was said and what was meant, in order to cross out any risky actions for himself in further cooperation with the guide, to which he responds quite tensely. In turn, after a few seconds, Xiao by herself, in a rather disturbing and frightening manner, decides to question her colleague as to what exactly she means by the wrong spirit, grabbing her by the shoulders. But modestly and somewhat frightened, hiding behind a certain hellish document, 
She replies that Xiao Bai confused this businessman with another guy with the same surname, who was supposed to be selected today, and the head of the corporation was supposed to die tomorrow. Xiao Bai openly panics, realizing that she has not made such a mistake for centuries and the consequences of such mistakes can be very, very terrible for her, besides, the conductor in a certain way attacks her colleague, trying in a certain strange way to push the responsibility onto her. The conductor in a white outfit suddenly hears the voice of Mr. Lu's soul, who in a calm and restrained tone states that she should not be so hard on herself, since every being is capable of making a mistake, regardless of rank or ability. The former head of the corporation continued his opinion that all mistakes can be forgiven if they were eventually corrected, leading the conversation to win some preferences from the hellish bureaucracy, to which Xiao Bai agrees, but only later realizes in shock who said it. The conductor in white suddenly screams either in fear or in anger and jumps closer to her colleague and further from the spirit of the young businessman, most likely shocked by the very fact that a mortal would interfere in such conversations. Somewhat hidden behind the shoulder of the conductor in a black outfit, the girl with a somewhat angry and irritated expression on her face asked how this spirit dares to eavesdrop on conversations that are neither his problem nor his business. To this, the spirit of the young entrepreneur, in a restrained tone, asserts that this is not true, since the situation concerns specifically his death and that he could not help but listen to this conversation, since the problem obviously relates to the level of matters of life and death. He continues his speech, in the same restrained tone, asking two hellish officials about the possible consequences for them of such a mistake on the part of their leadership, to which they only distracted their faces for a certain reason. Xiao Bai, the white-robed conductor, as if trying to calm herself, claims that this cannot be something super scary for her, since the mistake was made was small, only one day difference for a mortal, but her expression showed that she was not so definite, on this occasion. The spirit of the young businessman claims that it is still not in Xiao Bai's professional habits to do such erroneous actions, emphasizing her words from the past when she was not willing to cooperate with him for a little more lifetime, which of course hurts the girl a little. He goes on to say that despite all the chaos, if, in the end, life and death are truly predetermined, then his spirit will be able to meet its fate without much fuss, although it is still certainly a pity for him to die before he could achieve his goals. However, then the spirit of the former head of the corporation, in the same restrained tone, which somewhat frightens the hellish officials, claims that if this was all a mistake that cannot be corrected in the normal way, then he needs some compensation for this. Xiao Bai, realizing that the spirit of the young businessman knows how to negotiate very favorable preferences for himself, tries to deny him the idea of compensation, simply arguing that the mistake can be corrected and it can give him another day to live. The spirit of the young businessman responds to this with a specific example that if a consumer suffers serious health problems from a certain spoiled product, then replacing this product with a small monetary compensation cannot compare with the harm caused. Next, he poses two important and terrible questions for hellish officials, if the issue of compensation is so simple, then why does all the hellish bureaucracy exist and also about what exactly will happen to them if the spirit tells about their mistakes. Both conductors are quite frightened by such a speech, but Xiao Bai claims that nothing too terrible can happen for them, but still her voice sounds somewhat hesitant. The young businessman understands that this is most likely a bluff on the part of the hellish officials, and therefore reacts with restraint to these words, saying that if so, then they should continue their path to the hellish owner to whom he can tell about everything that happened. And this was more than enough to make both conductors change their minds and force them, clinging to his legs, asking for the possibility of negotiations, but the spirit of the entrepreneur continues on his way, saying that he is too busy for such negotiations, he must act. With a pitiful and frightening expression on her face, Xiao Bai asks him to stop and wait, apparently wondering what exactly they, as hell officials, will be able to offer this spirit in exchange for covering up her mistakes. The conductor in white and the conductor in black move away from the spirit at a fairly far distance so that it cannot overhear them and consult as to how they can buy the silence of this businessman and whether they can get out of this situation with dignity. Due to an indefinite amount of time feeling otherwise among these crimson fields, the infernal officials eventually announced that they had come to an agreement among themselves regarding possible compensation and were ready to offer the spirit of the young businessman an adequate solution to his situation. He orders the managers to speak, still retaining his managerial manner from his past life, 
to which they inform him of one of the decisions in his life, a contract under which, after the death of Mr. Liu, his internal organs will be transferred to the hospital as a donor. Taking this into account, infernal officials report that as soon as the doctors confirmed the death of the young businessman, most of the organs of his body were immediately given to those who needed it more under the terms of the above-mentioned contract. Realizing that a body without organs is not a good container for his reincarnated soul, the former head of the corporation confirms all this and asks for ideas, which the guides eventually came to, expecting some other solution than returning to the previous life. The black-robed guide claims that after quite a long search, they were able to find the body of a man from another world who committed suicide after his family went bankrupt due to his gambling addiction, saying that in this body the spirit will be able to start a new life. The spirit of the young entrepreneur ponders for a short time regarding this proposal and eventually realizes that this is perhaps the most profitable way out of the whole situation of his early death, so he reluctantly agrees to such an agreement. For some reason, this reaction surprises Xiao Bai, the girl in the white outfit, so she asks if he really would like to make some kind of more profitable deal for him, referring to his desire to become the richest entrepreneur in the whole world. The conductor in a black outfit instantly closes that mouth, since such reminders and comments can make the whole situation unprofitable for themselves, the spirit of the businessman himself says that for him youth is sufficient wealth, since the secrets of how to become richer are already known to him. At this point, the officials of the afterlife agree to fulfill this agreement and begin to gather forces to open a portal to a new life for this spirit, clots of mystical energy, shining with blue light, gather around them, and it is obvious that it will help them open the portal. The guides take each other's hands to concentrate this energy and direct it in the necessary direction, that is, to open the path for the spirit of a young businessman to his new life, after which in unison they pronounce the order for the spirit to be reborn in a new form. And now, among the crimson fields full of radiant lycoris, the flowers of death, a grandiose portal, completely woven from blue luminous energy, finally opens, from such an extravagant picture the spirit almost loses its balance. Upon completion of the formation of this portal, the guides tell him to hurry to his new life and the realization of his old dream, expressing to the spirit certain hopes that he will be able to live to old age at least in this life. And just like that, the spirit that belonged to the incredibly young head of a powerful Chinese corporation somewhat timidly entered through a strange portal, almost not believing that something new was waiting for him there, a life that would allow him to realize his old dream and goal. For a short time, the hellish officials were left alone with each other among the crimson fields, rejoicing that they managed to avoid a catastrophic situation with the help of this agreement, but it is unknown whether this catastrophe was even real. Xiao Bai, in a somewhat gloomy and dismissive tone, says that the nature of mere mortals is unchanged in the way they think about the possibility of equality with otherworldly beings in the level of any threat. In the same tone, the conductor in a black outfit promises that very soon they can again meet this interesting spirit of a young businessman, and now a terrible gambler, who miraculously escaped from his own noose. With sinister smiles, the officials of the underworld fold their hands in the same way as when creating a portal, likely concluding their meeting and preparing to form a new portal. Meanwhile, in another world in which our main character must be reborn, in the dead of night, loud sounds are heard on the traditional oriental roofs, as if someone is moving quickly along the tops of simple houses towards a certain distant goal. Few people may notice that this girl with red-brown flowing hair and wearing a black practical suit moves with extraordinary speed, which to some may seem like nothing more than a strong breath of wind. Eventually, she stops on one of the rooftops near a fairly large courtyard to recognize her target, perhaps spend a little time recovering her strength and breathing, and finally continue on her way to the place she should arrive at. With super powerful speed, just two elegant and wide jumps, the girl with outstanding physical abilities crossed the entire courtyard, quickly running to the main entrance to the residential part of this courtyard. Finally, this girl easily walked up to the red metal gate and quietly found herself in the main house of the courtyard, preparing to pick up the things she came for. However, suddenly she cries out in alarm throughout the courtyard, apparently barely understanding the circumstances in which she had to find herself, circumstances that she did not expect. The girl found herself in a room with a hanged male body, apparently promised to Mr. Liu, she asked herself where all the people were and where the money was, which was the purpose of her visit. The thief grabbed her head, 
trying to understand how so much had changed in just half a day in this recently crowded and rich courtyard. She looked at the man's body in the noose and said that he had really ruined his entire family, also noting that the body looked barely cold. Suddenly she notices a strange movement of the corpse's leg, watching it a little warily, and probably thinking that she was just imagining it. However, the next moment, the seemingly dead man began to make loud noises and vigorously wave his arms and legs, trying to free himself from the noose, which, of course, frightened the girl. From these movements, the rope of the noose breaks and the corpse quickly falls on the terrible thief, accompanied by his own scream. The girl begins to panic in this situation, thinking that despite her years of long travels and numerous rumors, she has never met a zombie, referring to the body that fell on her. In search of some kind of protection, she decides to pretend to be dead, trying not to move, not make a sound and hold her breath. The corpse, which was now the body container of Mr. Liu, meanwhile rises, also somewhat shocked by the circumstances in which he found himself, but quickly comes to his senses. The same guides who promised him a new life in the body of this man are mentioned in his head, and he begins to remember the events in his life that led this body to suicide. This man was born into a family of merchants that had already numbered three generations, so he had been quite wealthy since his childhood. As a teenager, he became involved with the young master of another Sioux merchant family, wasting his time on wine, entertainment and girls, without benefiting the family in any way. One day, this young Mr. Sioux took the guy to a gambling club, where he immediately won a large amount of money, and after winning several more times, he could not stop. In the end, his passion for gambling led his family to a monumental collapse, after which all property had to be confiscated and the family scattered around the world. Young Master Lu realized that he had nothing to lose in this life, so he decided to commit suicide, unable to cope with his own problems. Now Mr. Lu's new soul was pondering how to deal with the problems his predecessor had left him, including debts and enemies. In the end, he comes to the conclusion that the only correct solution is to find investors who can finance the solution to his problems for a small compensation. Only the question still arose of where he could look for investors if no one trusted his predecessor enough to borrow money. In these thoughts, he turned his attention to the girl lying in front of him, trying not to move or make a single suspicious sound. The reincarnated guy touched the thief's nose, wanting to check what was wrong with her and asked why she was still pretending to be dead in front of him. The girl, realizing that she was noticed and recognized as alive, not wanting to ignore her, retreated in panic from the guy, still mistaking him for dead. She folds her hands in a fighting pose and tells the guy not to approach, saying that she is not afraid and is ready at any moment to both defend herself and attack. To this, Mr. Liu replies that there is nothing to be afraid of here, since he is an ordinary living person, to which he claims that until recently his body was inanimate and cold. Meanwhile, the guy turns the topic to the girl herself, claiming that her physical abilities and black suit make her look like a thief. To this the thief replies that he and his family are the real bandits, while she is a noble person and gives all the loot to the poor. Hearing about all this, the new Mr. Lu notes that his predecessor must have a terrible reputation if stealing from him is considered noble. However, these anxious thoughts are subsequently interrupted by the understanding of the simple fact that this thief could become the first investor for his entrepreneurial ideas. The young man expresses his condolences to the girl, since, obviously, her whole journey was pointless, everything valuable from this house had long been taken away. She claims that she was here quite recently and knows that he had money for the wedding and bride price, so this cannot be true. Mr. Liu replies that he was visited by creditors who demanded payment of debts as soon as possible, which led to the whole dire situation he is now in. He continues to explain all of his possible problems that led him to the noose in great detail, as if trying to remember it all. The thief orders him to shut up and gets ready to leave, saying that she wanted to steal his money and distribute it to his victims, but, obviously, life punished him even without her. Mr. Liu stops her with a remark about whether she is going to continue her noble, but still criminal life until her death. The girl continues to claim that she is not a simple thief who steals for no reason, she is a noble person who acts according to her own code of honor. To this, the young man asks whether the girl has thought about her future, whether she will continue her criminal activities decades from now. She replies that, of course, her plans prioritize the punishment of various swindlers, speculators and corrupt officials of various types. Young Master Lu confirms that this is certainly a chivalric ideal, 
worthy of praise when it is so brilliantly observed, which the girl takes as a compliment. However, he goes on to ask whether the noble thief ever thought that it was very likely that her life would be lonely due to such a career. To this, the robber argues that this is a cerebral concept and some big people of her profession still have families and successful marriages, so there is no reason for her case to be different. Mr. Liu thinks that his tactics have worked after all, and he continues to ask if this thief has someone, to which he receives the answer that it is none of his business. Later, the girl notes to herself that this argument with some guy who barely knows life outside of gaming clubs and brothels is pointless. The noble thief reaches one of the beams under the roof in one elegant leap and prepares to get out of this house and this man. A second later, she quickly glances at Mr. Liu and bids him farewell but he is not willing to let her go so easily. The guy restrainedly claims that the beautiful and loyal noble robbers of various fairy tales exist only in fairy tales and legends, not in reality. He continues his attempt to convince the girl, saying that real robbers, if they don't look disgusting, are simply big and scary, which somewhat frightens her. In the end, his further speech about the many shortcomings of robbers made the thief somewhat distracted, which is why she fell loudly onto the wooden floor. Annoyed by this talk and perhaps her own downfall, the girl orders the merchant to shut his mouth, but her words are ignored. Mr. Liu continues to talk about the impolite speech, lack of hygiene and other wild traits of the bandits who may one day claim her heart. In the end, he asks if she can imagine being married to someone like that, being such a beautiful girl, in other words, he is openly manipulating her emotions. To this, the kidnapper angrily replies that marriage is not her goal, since she plans to stand up for justice all her life, punishing those like him. However, the guy says that she is unlikely to be able to do this until she is old, simply because her body will no longer be so young, flexible and skillful. Mr. Liu, in a somewhat condescending and condescending tone, asks if she is not afraid that one day, when her physical strength is no longer the same, she will be captured by simple sentries. To this, the girl grabs him by the clothes and screams in his face to shut up and that he should not put pressure on her old wounds if he wants to somehow improve his reputation. She angrily claims that it was not her decision to take this criminal path, and numerous scammers, speculators, and corrupt officials are to blame for everything. In the end, the girl's anger turns to despondency, after which she asks herself what else she could and can do under such circumstances. Mr. Liu, being first and foremost a merchant, notes about himself that his trap, the method of persuasion, has finally worked, exactly as he planned. He offers the thief a new life in which she can clear her name and become a rich, successful woman who does not need to hide behind a man's back. The merchant continues to talk about what awaits her with this wealth, the ability to choose any man, distribute funds, helping the poor, etc. The girl refuses, calling these plans themselves unrealistic, to which the merchant tells her that he can and wants to implement something similar to his. He adds his signature line about knowing the secret before becoming a rich man in an attempt to finally convince his first investor. The thief calls this nonsense, accusing the merchant of fraud and lies, adding that if he had known something, he would not have incurred such debts. To this Mr. Liu replies that he belongs to the third generation of a family of merchants and that if he did not know how to earn money, he would not have it for such expenses. He claims to know the story of how his grandfather was able to provide for their entire family by selling only two horses. The thief replies that this is a terrible lie, two horses are worth only 50 silver coins, while their yard itself is worth at least a thousand silver coins. The merchant grabs his head, as if tired of the noise, and simply asks that the girl listen to him, promising that the story will not be long. The girl calms down somewhat and, obviously having certain hopes and expectations, decides to stay and listen to what he has to say. She quickly sits down on the bench, crossing her legs and making herself more comfortable, after which she orders the merchant to begin his story. Mr. Liu tells the story of how his grandfather came to the local market to sell his horse, calling out to all the passers-by who might become his buyers. That merchant praises his horse in every possible way, talking about how convenient it is to travel on it and how it is a magnet for beautiful ladies, but all this is not the main thing. The main feature of the sale of his horse was a special promotion, under the terms of which, if after a week of use the horse is not suitable, you can return it and get your money back. Hearing about this, one of the peasants decides to buy this horse to grind flour, adding that if he likes it, he will buy it completely. The girl doesn't really understand the essence of this operation, 
so she asks with interest what happened next with this horse and the client. Mr. Liu replies that a week later the horse was returned to his grandfather, to which the girl responds with laughter, saying that this is a very dubious trade. However, the merchant, with a somewhat sly smile of a man passionate about his business, says that just after this comes the key moment of this operation. After people saw that there was no deception, they also wanted to try to take the free horse, creating whole queues of people who wanted it. However, already on the third client, something happens that the grandfather trader apparently expected as the basis of his operation, because it is not possible to return the horse. The man claims that his child does not want to say goodbye to the horse and he did not bring it, adding that he wanted to buy it anyway. And that's how Mr. Liu's grandfather received his first 30 silver coins in this transaction, politely thanking his buyer and preparing for other sales. The thief says that selling a horse is not such hard work, and in general this whole scheme looks like the effort expended is much greater than the result. In this case, the merchant claims that this is the central part of the overall scheme, his grandfather quietly brings the mare to his buyer's court. This causes the purchased horse to behave inappropriately, apparently due to certain reproductive issues, but to the buyer the horse looks simply distraught. His wife, frightened that their son particularly frequents this horse and could be maimed if the horse is in this condition, demands that the animal be returned. The buyer comes to his grandfather, Mr. Liu, along with the horse and claims that he is most likely sick and he has come to return it back. The grandfather trader claims that the horse is absolutely healthy and, since the buyer has already purchased the horse, it is no longer possible to return or exchange it. The man claims that this horse cannot stay in his house anyway, so they must come up with some kind of solution to this problem. The trader offers his former buyer to resell the horse if it is such a big problem for his family. The man expresses his confusion as to why this horse is only behaving normally in front of a trader, while a bottle of mare urine can be seen in the trader's hands. The merchant claims that he is ready to buy his horse back, but only for 30% of the original amount, and the man offers 80. Grandfather Lu claims that he simply cannot give more than 40%, while his buyer says that this is not enough, asking for 70. Ultimately, the two people decide that 50% of the original amount is a fairly reasonable amount for both parties, given the circumstances. Mr. Liu further states that in this way his grandfather traveled to many places and made money while still having horses to sell each time. The girl reacts with shock at how this big scheme works, and Mr. Liu asks if she trusts him to be able to fulfill what he promised. However, the thief, having listened to this whole story, which smacked a big fraud to her, hit the guy in the face, calling him a speculator. To this, the merchant asked whether the law was broken in this scheme and whether anyone was forcibly forced to do something, to which he received a negative answer in a restrained manner. Consequently, he asks how this can be a scam if no law was broken or people were forced to do something against their will, to which the girl tries to hush up the topic of conversation. The merchant thinks that the girl finally believes in his abilities, so he invites her to become his business partner and offers her to earn big money. He extends his hand to her as a symbol of an agreement for further cooperation between them, adding that they can reach the top. After a few seconds of thought, the girl claims that if he wants to reach the top, then why does he need her, to which the merchant replies that he has no money. He says that under the terms of their joint agreement, the thief will invest money, while the merchant will increase these amounts many times over. In the end, Mr. Liu suggests that the girl start with a small goal, reaching the amount of a thousand silver coins within a month. The girl is incredibly shocked by this proposal, perceiving it as an inappropriate joke and not understanding how this is possible. She claims that 1,000 silver coins is equal to about 80 years of work for the average family, even without food expenses. Subsequently, the thief comes to a certain idea and directly confronts the merchant or is it not in his plans to suddenly run away with the money, like his grandfather. To this the guy replies that although his method was somewhat incorrect, he can assure the girl that his future business will be absolutely legal. He adds that with the physical abilities of the thief, there was no way he could hope to escape without further attempts at revenge. The girl smiled at the merchant, holding one of her special knives behind her back, which she used as a throwing projectile. The next moment, flying across the entire room and at the merchant's head, this knife, with a loud sound, instantly killed a cockroach on one of the walls of the room. Having performed a similar trick, the girl arrogantly confirmed that with her abilities, even if something goes wrong, the merchant will not live one extra second. Hearing this, 
The merchant asked why the thief was afraid in this operation if she was in no danger with such a partner. With a thoughtful look, the thief slightly changes the topic, asking how much money the merchant needs to achieve his stated goal. After much guessing, Lu Lu claims that a hundred silver coins would be enough for him, obviously a huge amount for a simple girl. She again grabs the guy by his clothes and angrily screams about how she can trust him with such a sum, which is her only savings for her old age. Realizing that he cannot see hundreds of silver coins, the merchant radically reduces his demands and asks for just one kopeck. Such an insane discount can cause nothing but shock and questions, the girl was truly incredibly surprised by this request. The merchant says that he needs to demonstrate at least some results in order to be taken seriously and that then it is her decision whether to invest money. The girl thinks for quite a long time about whether this is some kind of another fraudulent scheme, like the one that the merchant talked about earlier. In the end, she agrees to give him one penny, wanting to see what he can achieve with such a meager amount. The guy is surprised that the penny was taken from his chest, but pulls himself together and orders the girl to wait for him here. Promising to return soon, the merchant leaves the house in a hasty manner, leaving the thief alone. At the same moment, the girl remembers that the reward on her head is equal to one and a half thousand silver coins, so this could be a method with which the merchant will earn money. And just like that, the girl leaves the Lu family courtyard, intending to secretly spy on the merchant and kill him if he tries to rat her out. Meanwhile, on the thief's path, one could notice two drunkards barely walking, humming some strange song. One of them, with a tragic or rather painful expression on his face, asked the other to pour him more. Of course, having noticed how the girl literally flies over the city with numerous acrobatic tricks, they could not resist commenting. In the end, the thief saw the dealer approaching the police building, next to the wanted poster, and hid on the roof not far from the place. This seems to her enough to prove to herself Mr. Lu's stupid intentions of handing her over to the sentries for a monetary reward. The thief pulled out one of her throwing knives from behind her back and stood in an expectant position, watching Lu's every move. To her surprise, and to the surprise of the sentries themselves, the merchant suddenly laughs loudly, still standing near the wanted poster for the thief, Red Lotus. One of the guards suspiciously asks why the guy is suddenly laughing in such a place that could make him laugh. The merchant replies that there is nothing so funny here, he is just wondering who painted the portrait of this Red Lotus. The portrait looked really questionable, exaggerating the facial features and adding traditionally unsightly features, Lu continued to mock this image in detail. The guard ignores these words and says that the Red Lotus is known in many provinces and if the merchant has any information, he receives a reward, the girl watches this with intense attention. The guy says that helping to find such a big criminal is always noble and promises to provide information if he has it. After these words, he says goodbye to the officer and leaves, to the great surprise of the thief who had been watching him all this time. The merchant went further into the shopping districts, where they sold everything that this world could offer in this day, food, clothing, sentimental souvenirs and entertainment. The guy mentally noted about himself that all these scenes reminded him of science fiction films that he watched in a past life. Suddenly, the merchant notices a small crowd gathering near the bazaar, condemning or pitying the object of their attention. In front of the crowd sat a white-haired young girl with a tablet with an inscription on it, who claimed that she sold herself into slavery to bury her own mother. The merchant looked at the penny given to him and thought about whether he could somehow influence this situation or use it to his advantage. Suddenly, the guy hears someone calling out to him as young Master Lu, which makes him tense up considering the debts of his current life. His old acquaintance Master Su appears in front of him, saying that Lu has the courage to go out onto the shopping street after all the huge debts that he has acquired. Lu remembered him from memories from a past life, remembered how the young man simply deceived his predecessor in this body, making him a gambler. The merchant throws his copper penny in the air, saying that his family often heard one wise phrase that is very close to him. After catching a penny in the air, he continued by saying that the essence of this wisdom is that as long as life goes on, every person has a chance at anything. Chuckling, the young master of the family will ask the merchant if he has any funds left, after all the debts and problems. Master Su, in a dramatic pose, points to the single penny in the guy's hands and asks in a patronizing manner if this is a joke on them. Mr. Lu says that he can get money because he has a dream that guides him through life, to which the other powerful merchant just chuckles. Patting the guy on the shoulder in a faintly friendly manner, Master Su wishes his competitor good luck, 
pronouncing every syllable of his name strangely. Surrounded by his servants, who comment in every possible way about how Lu will not be able to achieve anything with one penny and how that is all he has, the master moves on. He notices an unhappy white-haired girl putting herself up for sale due to poverty and the sudden death of her mother, noting how tragic this situation is. Somewhat hiding his face behind a black decorated fan, Master Su notes how caring his daughter is in front of him, saying that he likes this type. In the end, he bends down to get a better look at the girl, saying that he just needs a maid to warm his personal bed, while she hides terribly behind her sign with the inscription. The crowd whispers that the girl will be unlucky if she ends up in the Su family's house, remembering the many unkind things they have heard about them. Master Su orders the girl to be given some silver and gives his subordinates time to take advantage of the new slave, after which she must be washed and taken to his residence. Suddenly, Mr. Lu stands up for a terrible girl who is about to fall into terrible slavery to an equally terrible man. After a few seconds, Master Su notices this and asks in surprise whether Lu himself, known for his dubious romantic scams, liked this girl. The merchant looked at the unfortunate white-haired girl, whose eyes were filled with surprise, awe, and hope that he wanted and could save her. Master Su, in turn, continued to mock his former competitor, wondering if he had brought money to buy this girl. Together with the servants, he claims that now the Su family is many times richer than even the past of the Lu family, so the merchant will not be able to live the same way. Mr. Lu decides to address the audience, saying that he has been a fool all his life and only now, having lost his family, he understood this pain of loss. He continues to talk, claiming that if the girl ends up in the Su family, her fate will be worse than death itself, which naturally frightens her. The guy takes out the same penny from his pocket, talking about whether people around can afford to leave the girl alone with this terrible fate. And so he puts his penny into the hands of the unfortunate woman, smiling good-naturedly in her direction. The crowd begins to whisper among themselves, wondering if they could come to the aid of this girl just like Mr. Lu. Finally, the first voice spoke, claiming that it was just a matter of one penny and that he should help, after which almost the entire crowd joined forces to save the girl. And so, when she had a whole mountain of coppers, the girl burst into tears of happiness and thanked Mr. Lu and everyone involved for their kindness. The merchant says that there is more than enough money here for the mother's funeral, and the rest can go to the brother about whom it was written on the sign. After that, Lu looked at Master Su in a condescending manner and noted that that was why he finally didn't get what he wanted. The master claims that this ruined his day, so he orders his servants to beat Lu, but not to death, since death would be too merciful a punishment. The servants get into a fighting position and run in the direction of their opponent, while simultaneously saying how he dared to ruin the master's mood. Surprisingly, Lu Yun fights off this attack, punching one of the servants quite hard in the face and knocking out one of his teeth. This tooth, in turn, flies further, hitting Master Su himself in the face, which is why he almost lost his balance and was unable to hold the fan in his hand. Master Su cries out that he is in pain as this tooth hit him in the forehead, either leaving the blood of his subordinate, or spilling the blood of Su himself. Lu Yun barely reacts to these words, at the same time remembering that in his previous life he did a lot of boxing, noting that this body is quite weak and he should start training. Master Su is shocked by such skills and angrily asks when the merchant managed to learn such things, even accusing him of not being Lu Yong. To this, the merchant replies that it is true that the previous Lu Yun has died and now a new one has been born, apparently planning for this to be taken metaphorically. He adds that he knows about the joint ownership of the casino between Master Su and Mr. Zhou, saying that this is a really interesting scheme and assuring that he will return the entire amount. Master Su just laughs it off, saying that in a month of Lu Yun, Mr. Zhou himself will come and take away all his property, which will end his entire career. He also adds that if he only asks, Mr. Zhou will take Lu's life as part of the debt, to which he only talks about how good their relationship should be. Master Su claims that if Lu cleans his shoes with his tongue, he will take pity and ask Mr. Zhou to spare the life of the unfortunate woman. However, Lu Yun ignores this proposal, saying that he will see how things pan out further with his plans for the future. The young master is incredibly annoyed by such brazen behavior from his point of view, and promises that the entire Lu family will die because of his actions. Meanwhile, not far from Lu's own yard, the same white-haired girl whom he saved along with a crowd of caring people was waiting for the boy. The merchant restrainedly asks what the girl is doing here, to which he cannot immediately find an answer, 
still not moving away from the horror of this day. Remembering this, Lu Yun asks if she managed to bury her mother so quickly in this short period of time. In a somewhat worried tone, the girl confirms this, calls herself Ling Lan and says that she wants to become Mr. Lu's maid to repay his kindness, to which he tells her not to worry about it. He tries to go further, but the girl insists on her help, saying that her older brother always said that kindness should be paid for. The merchant understands that he cannot part with Ling Lan so easily, so he asks if she has any money left after that meeting. Lin replies that they stayed and hands her savior a wallet, from which he takes only one penny and says that now everything should be fine, with which the girl does not agree. In the end, Mr. Lu asks if Ling Lan can read and write, meaning another retribution for her that will suit her, the girl answers in the affirmative. Having heard this answer, the merchant says that then she can become his secretary, and with a strong desire, even his first employee, which raises many questions from the girl. Lu Yun explains that she will need to carry out various tasks for him and accompany him in various circumstances, to which Ling Lan asks how this is different from being a slave to some prince. The merchant says that there is a big difference between the two professions as he will of course pay the girl for her hard work. After a few seconds of thought, Ling Lan agrees to these conditions, saying that she agrees to everything the guy wants. This sounds rather awkward for the merchant, since obviously the girl has a more servile perception of her further work than what he needs, but he is ready to work on it too. Lu Yun formally introduces himself and congratulates Ling Lan on becoming the first employee of the Lu company, to which the girl reacts with surprise. Finally, the merchant invites his new employee into his yard, inviting her to come in and eat. Entering his home, Lu Yun proclaims his return, warning and informing Red Lotus, his first investor. He looks in different directions, saying that now is not the time for hiding and they should start as quickly as possible, Ling Lan only looks around in surprise, clinging to the guy's hand. A voice from above, from one of the beams on which the robber was sitting, asked how Lu Yun realized that she was hiding, why he did not assume that she had left. Lu Yun simply and restrainedly replies that all this is because she gave him the same penny. The girl confirms, saying that it is just a penny, not of much value to her, it is not an investment worth keeping an eye on. The merchant says that the value of this coin is much more than one penny, since it represents the Red Lotus's interest in whether he is able to fulfill his promise. The robber calls him a self-confident loser, and says that he is just wondering what such a person would do in such a situation, Lu meanwhile asks if the girl has been following him all this time. Red Lotus was shocked that the merchant somehow managed to find out about this, so she asks how he saw her if she was hiding so carefully. The guy replies that it would be amazing for her to sit in his house all day and dream about future income without suspicion. The merchant adds that he has very high standards for his business partners, thus trying to praise Red Lotus's behavior. To this, the thief only turns his gaze away from the guy, saying that no one needs the approval of a pathetic loser, especially not her. He invites the robber to finally come down from the supporting roof of the structure and talk about all the things and ideas that he has now. The merchant says that he cannot concentrate otherwise, hinting that the robber is sitting in an obscene position. Somewhat ashamed, the girl decides to come down from the top, reaching the floor in one elegant leap in typical fashion and walking towards Lu. Red Lotus approaches him and confidently confronts the guy, asking what kind of plan he managed to come up with, suspecting dubiously legal ideas. To the girl's surprise, the merchant says that he has completely developed an ideal plan for further business in which the robber can invest. Red Lotus notices a basket of vegetables in the guy's hands and a white-haired girl who was hiding in fear behind his back. She quickly understands the risks and asks if he suddenly decided to do to this girl what his grandfather did to the horse, to which Lu responds with surprise, obviously not expecting her to think about it. The bandit threatens to bury the merchant alive if he actually does anything remotely like Ling Lan. In response, Lu Yun orders him to be released, saying that she might damage the vegetables, which are the main character of his business plan. The girl moves away from the merchant, but looking at the basket, she sees that there are enough products there for him to spend just one penny on them. Lu Yun, meanwhile, takes the same penny out of his pocket and throws it to his investor, to which she only asks in surprise how this is even possible. The merchant says that the value of this coin is really not to acquire something and use it in further work, but to convince the Red Lotus of his abilities. Regarding where he got the eyes, Lu Yun says he met an old woman in the market who had trouble speaking and could barely sell her vegetables. The guy helped her with sales, encouraging many passers-by to buy, 
and as gratitude received a small amount of vegetables for himself. Subsequently, a similar situation occurred with one butcher, who really wanted to go to the toilet, but could not leave his place, Lu Yun agreed to stay at the counter in his place and also received food as gratitude. Red Lotus asks with some irritation what kind of coincidence it is that suddenly everyone in the market suddenly needed someone's help. Lu Yun, in turn, replies that he managed to see several merchants who were not doing well, so he decided to help them for some compensation. Then the guy says that finding a business opportunity is the first step to making money, but Red Lotus says that with these vegetables he won't see thousands of silver coins. Lu Yun tells the girls to go to the stone pavilion behind his courtyard, saying that the road show will start soon. With that, he quickly runs out of the house to the surprise of Lotus, who says that he doesn't believe in his superpowers on this matter joking that he is going to go into hiding. Finally, Red Lotus and Ling Lan listened to this and after a while, they sat relatively peacefully in the stone pavilion and waited for Lu. The robber finally finds time to pay more attention to the white-haired girl and asks her how she got here. Ling Lan replies that there was no deception on Lu's part, fearing an angry reaction, continuing that he saved her and she decided to come herself. Red Lotus anxiously asked the girl about rescue, fearing what she might be rescued from. Ling Lan explained in a sad tone that her mother had recently died, but she couldn't force out more information because it was painful. The robber, in a somewhat pathetic tone, told her not to worry, since Ling Lan was now under her protection, and if Lu did anything, she would definitely do something to him. The girl explains that Lu is kind, she wanted to repay his kindness by becoming a servant or maid, but he refused. Red Lotus is somewhat confused about the details of this situation, asking whether Lu brought her here or what even happened. Ling Lan conveys Lu's words that he does not want to make her a slave, saying that he, like an ordinary person, should receive payment for his work, and therefore offered to work for him. The robber is surprised to hear such words about the merchant, so she asks the girl again, to which she confirms and says that Lu is not at all like other people. Meanwhile, the merchant himself arrives, eventually cooking something from the food he got from the market, cheerfully announcing that he brought goodies. Lotus asks what is in front of her, and Ling Lan just looks in surprise at the strange dish with various foods on skewers. Lu Yun holds up a special sauce brush and says it's malatin, emphasizing each syllable to mark its importance. To the surprise of the girls, the merchant offers them two possible versions of malatin, a specific dish of Sichuan cuisine, spicy and sweet. Lotus says that he wants a slightly spicy version, but Ling Lan at first does not understand that this is also possible, but after Lu's permission, he chooses sweet malatin. Subsequently, the merchant hands them small bowls of broth, in which various vegetables lay on long skewers, Lotus is embarrassed as to how she should eat something like that, which he shows. Ling Lan understood how it worked and finally tasted this malatin, surprised at how tasty this dish was, the robber only watched it thoughtfully. Lu Yun offers her new employee a spicy version of the dish, to which she agrees, fascinated by the first option, while Lotus is still in doubt. In the end, she decides to take a bite of one of the vegetables on the long skewer with a lot of suspicion in her eyes, eventually coming to the same conclusion as Ling Lan, the dish is very tasty. Subsequently, she also notices an interesting combination of different flavors, a strong heat along with spiciness, and feels that it is one of the most delicious dishes she has ever eaten. Satisfied with the result, the girls demand more of the same dish, to which Lu refuses them, saying that there is no more and this was only his way of getting investors interested. Considering that this is only such a way of influence and that the Red Lotus liked the deal, Lu Yun asks for her opinion as his first investor. After some thought, the robber says that the dish is very tasty and can appeal to most people, regardless of class. Secondly, the dish is prepared very easily and from available products that can be easily purchased at the local market, and thirdly, it is something new and interesting. However, after this, Red Lotus asks the merchant if she has the money to open some place to sell malatin, then why not start this business herself? Ling Lan is very excited by such speculation and tries to say something to Lotus, but still demands from the merchant a reason why he should do this business. Lu Yun claims that this is all because he has a bronze killer, holding a small cup in his hand. Naturally, Ling Lan and Red Lotus ask what he means by this bronze killer, but he does not have time to answer. He is shouted loudly by a crowd of adult men who instantly knock down the gate to the courtyard, 
breaking the entire simple idol of their meal. At the head of these fighters was Mr. Zhou, an adult man with a patch over his left eye, and behind the crowd stood young Master Su, smiling. Red Lotus plans to immediately engage in a fight, however Lu Yun signals her not to do so, meanwhile quickly passing the cup containing the bronze assassin to Ling Lan. After this, the young merchant comes closer to the crowd and asks Mr. Zhou and Master Su what they need, Zhou replies that they have come to take the house. The man points at Lu Yun and orders him to pack his things and get out of this house since it no longer belongs to him. The merchant says that he still has a month to pay the debt, so Mr. Zhou and his men came too early. Master Su says that he and Zhou have decided to set up a pavilion here and tomorrow is the ideal time to open, adding that the guy can remain a eunuch who will even be fed. Subsequently, Su notices that Lu Yun is not here alone, but in the company of girls, including Ling Lan, he asks what exactly he did that made her agree to come to the courtyard. He orders the crowd to bring the girls to him, after which he will probably turn them into slaves, also inviting Mr. Zhou to have fun with them first. The Red Lotus cannot withstand such impudence and once again rushes to attack a whole crowd of fighters. Lu Yun once again tries to stop her, causing an angry reaction, and only then whispering that she needs to wait for the right moment to attack. The merchant approaches the casino owner, Mr. Zhou, saying that of course he wants to pay off his own debts and start over. Lu Yun says that their agreement was that if all debts were not paid within a month, then he would give them all the property of the Lu family, adding that who would go to his establishment if he did not keep his word. Mr. Zhou tells the entire crowd that this is true, trust in any business is the foundation, and if anyone finds out about this attack, Zhou's reputation will be ruined. With a smile on his face, Casino owner and creditor Lu Yun orders his subordinates to close the gate to the court. After this, Zhou continues that in the end, if nothing goes beyond this court, his reputation will not be damaged in any way. He asks Master Su for his thoughts, to which he replies that he did not expect anything else from his companion, glad that Zhou is still on his side. Red Lotus, of course, cannot contain her anger at these brazen criminals, preparing one of her knives to throw behind her back. Meanwhile, Lu Yun tells her that this will only increase the bounty on her head and completely ruin not only his life, but also Ling Lan's. The robber asks what to do then, if with or without a fight, they have almost no chance of a normal solution to this situation. And after that, Lu Yun tells his investor to watch what he will do to get out of this problem alive and with money. Mr. Zhou says that the guy was given a chance before, so now he should be grateful and submit by giving away his house. Master Su, in turn, mockingly offers an alternative to this solution, saying that Lu Yun will even be able to choose his own death. Lu Yun continues to insist that he will transfer the entire amount of the debt of 1,200 silver coins to Mr. Zhou. The merchant adds to this that if he fails to pay off the entire debt in full within this period, he will not only hand over all his property, but will also become a slave to Zhou. Such a statement shocks not only the Red Lotus, but also everyone present, including Zhou and Su, the robber asks if he is crazy, planning to earn such a sum in a month. Master Su immediately tells his companion not to listen to such statements, claiming that this is just a bluff, an attempt to delay his death for at least some days. Meanwhile, Lu Yun continues to convince the casino owner, saying that such an amount, approximately equal to his profit from the casino for six months, looks very attractive for just one month. Mr. Zhou still doubts this, so the merchant raises his bid to one and a half thousand silver coins, shocking Red Lotus. Lu Yun continues to insist on his proposal, claiming that the casino owner has been extracting money from the Lu family for two years, but here he can earn such a huge amount in a month. Red Lotus once again reproaches the merchant, not realizing that he has completely lost common sense if he makes such offers. Master Su at this time continues to convince the crowd that Lu Yun is bluffing and there is no benefit to them from listening to him. He orders the fighters to kill their competitor as soon as possible, but after a few tens of seconds of reflection, Mr. Zhou gestures to the fighters to stop them and agrees to this agreement. Mr. Zhou warns that Lu Yun will never be able to escape from the city, and if in a month he does not pay off his debts, the owner will take away both his property and his life. At this point, Mr. Zhou and Master Su leave, the latter, in an angry state, orders some fighters to constantly monitor the merchant, promising himself to destroy him. As soon as they went, 
Red Lotus finally got a chance to deal with all these statements, angrily asking how he was going to find such huge money. Holding on to her belt, Ling Lan asks her not to be angry, obviously fearing the angry bandit. Liu Yun, with a slight smile on his face, asks Red Lotus if she really thinks that his plans included that Su and Zhou would receive the money. Responding to the surprised looks, the merchant said that as soon as the two had agreed to this agreement, they had already fallen into its trap. The girl still didn't understand what kind of trap they were talking about, and Lu Yun added that he would force them to return all the money and property they had lost at Zhou's casino. Suddenly, Red Lotus touches the merchant's head and checks to see if he is okay, causing him to react in surprise. After this strange check, the girl takes Ling Lan by the hand and says that Lu Yun has gone completely crazy and she should take her to her older brother. However, suddenly the white-haired girl says that she will not go anywhere because she believes that the merchant is capable of doing everything he says. Sighing heavily, the robber decides to give Lu Yun the word about what he has come up with as a way to quickly earn this enormous sum. Red Lotus reminds that Zhou and Su are a very cunning and simply dangerous duo that cannot be dealt with easily, so why should they return the money to Lu? To this, the merchant replies that these two are very greedy, and that is why they will return this money, which causes a tired negative reaction from the robber. After this, Lu Yun also claims that he is even more greedy and once again offers the Red Lotus to earn as much money as possible, without actually revealing a single plan. After some thought, the robber says that she no longer cares and is ready to take part in this scam, adding that if he does not do what he promised, then she will simply steal Zhou and Su's money. She takes out a small bag of silver coins from her bosom and hands them to Lu Yun as her first investment in his crazy plan. At this, the merchant smiles contentedly and shakes hands with Red Lotus, recognizing her as his business partner, adding that it is a pleasure to do business with her. Next, Lu Yun looks at Ling Lan and says that he expects good work from his employee, to which he replies with a smile that he will try. And at this moment the robber asks what they should do next according to the merchant's plan. Lu Yun thoughtfully says that now they should buy food and kitchen appliances for work, and also start making promotional cards and decorating the place. After thinking about all this, the merchant says that they will begin their work, considering that they do not have much time, Ling Lan supports this decision. In turn, Red Lotus is dissatisfied with the fact that when investing in this business, for some reason she is also obliged to work. Lu Yun claims that he never said that the partners only invest money, to which the robber replies that she feels like she has fallen into the trap of a merchant. After some time, the guy is busy sketching the things he needs to start operating his future establishment, with the goal of sending Lotus and Lin for the equipment. Lu Yun gives the robber an image with a saucepan, a brush, a ladle, and a special shape, saying that she should go to the blacksmith and order such a set from him, the girl barely understands what is drawn on the paper. For Ling Lan, he draws another paper with a bowl, a basket, and a cabinet, ordering her to go and order all these things from the carpenter. This is exactly how the Red Lotus goes to the blacksmith with this strange piece of paper, which causes surprise and misunderstanding in the man. Meanwhile, you can see how some of Master Su's men are watching the robber in order to find out what Lu Yun's plan is to pay off the debts to him and Mr. Zhou. Ling Lan also comes to the carpenter with her diagram, which is easier to understand, Master Su's people are also watching the girl. After some time, it came to decorating the place where Malatin was to be sold, the merchant carried two bamboo trunks, there was only one Lin, and the red lotus, with barely any effort, carried a whole monkey of these trunks. They begin to cut this bamboo, Ling Lan complains that it is very long and they may not have time, but as a merchant he says that this is an important part of the work. Red Lotus, in turn, says that this is a very slow process and shows her abilities by causing three knives to fly near the merchant and crash into the wood. Also at this moment, the robber notices strange movements behind a small window in the courtyard wall, suspecting that they are being watched. With her subsequent blow, the girl launches two bamboo plates in the same direction where the knives were flying and instantly cuts the bamboo into small pieces. Lu Yun and Ling Lan praise the robber for such impressive and useful skills, although the girl eventually notices that among the cut pieces there seems to be another one. Of course, this piece flew into the face of Master Su's fighter, who had been watching them all this time. The merchant replies to his subordinate that she probably imagined it, smiling towards Lotus, obviously guessing what was happening. A few seconds and Lu Yun dumps all this preparation related to bamboos on the robber, 
to her great anger and disappointment. After some time, the trio of companions arrives at the abandoned structure of the Lu family, from which the merchant decided to make a new establishment where Malatin will be sold. The merchant rolls up his sleeves and says it's time to start cleaning, followed by Ling Lan's cheers. Red Lotus says that she won't help this time, apparently still resentful of the past matter, but she later sees that the two can't do anything without her. The robber ties her hair into a ponytail and says that they should water the floor first before cleaning up the dust, and goes to help. Two days later, a new restaurant finally opened in place of this train, with a sign on which Malatin was written in red, as passers-by watched in surprise. People whispered about how the Lu family went bankrupt and how they had the money to open it, while others wondered with interest what Malatin was and why the restaurant opened on the site of a warehouse. Some even noted that the younger Lu didn't have the business knowledge to open something like that, adding that he might have a strong desire to live if he was trying to pay off his debt. Not far from the new restaurant was the house of the Su family, from which the young master, with food and in the company of a servant, could observe his competitor. The servant had a bandaged head, since he was the one who was injured by the Red Lotus, and reported that the other day Lu Yun was doing very strange things that he did not understand. Master Su mockingly says that, of course, things are incomprehensible to his servant, who is not at all familiar with business or trade. Before this, he adds in an ominous tone that in any case, if Lu dares to sell food again, he will face a big failure. Su talks about how food in this city is his family specialty, which in a sense now has a monopoly on the market, and then turns his attention to the window, observing the new restaurant. Lu, meanwhile, asks his workers if everything is ready and, having received an approving answer, prepares to call out possible buyers with something like a megaphone. He shouts to everyone passing by about the opening of a new restaurant called Malatin Yu Lu, saying that their specialty is fresh savory snacks, also adding affordable prices and a large selection. Ling Lan and Red Lotus present a large counter with many different foods in freshly made cups. The merchant asks for the finished broth, to which the robber responds approvingly, and opens the lid of a large saucepan, attracting passers-by with a strong, tasty smell. Master Su's servant also says that it smells delicious, but the master himself denies this, calling the dish only a mishmash of different seasonings. But even he has to admit that it attracts many less food-savvy customers, adding that Lu is a rather unconventional thinker. The servant begins to fuss, worried about the progress of the case, but Su says that Lu Yun is just a clown who has not inherited his father's skills at all, so it's even worse for him that the restaurant business has gone so far. The master claims that Lu Yun made a fatal mistake for him, but did not specify what exactly he means. Meanwhile, the merchant himself continues to encourage all passers-by to come into his restaurant, saying that it is opening today. He points to Ling Lan, who is holding quite large stacks of pieces of paper, saying that anyone can use a coupon to get free Malatin today. Hearing about the free food, passers-by immediately attacked the girl, demanding promotional coupons from her. Servant Su says that Lu seems quite popular on the first day, saying that they must do something, however the master himself states that they must continue to observe. Malatin was prepared quite quickly and served in an elegant manner, attracting even more passers-by with its strong aroma. People sat at the tables of the new restaurant, waiting for their orders and reacting to Ling Lan's every phrase. The girl was carrying two trays with a bunch of different dishes, confused and a little tired, looking for an order for the first table. Meanwhile, Lu Yun and Red Lotus stand at the entrance to the restaurant, the robber comments on how quickly the restaurant ran out of seats. She subsequently notices Master Su watching them, to which the merchant replies that he still thinks of them as flies and is simply mocking them. The girl doesn't understand how Su mocks them if everyone in the restaurant is happy with the food and nothing bad happens. The merchant tells her that in Master Su's opinion, an uneducated opponent is too boring to even be called an opponent. However, it is clear that Lu Yun is not going to so easily admit that Su is superior to him in any way, promising that the fun is just beginning. And the first day in the restaurant continues, people order additional portions of tofu and noodles. After about half of the working day, the crowd had decreased a little, and with them the workload on the workers, so the Red Lotus asked how much they had already earned. Ling Lan says in a sad tone that in fact, there weren't that many people who ate not only the free portions, but also ordered something extra today. Lu Yun opens the box in which the money of this restaurant is kept, 
and together the three partners total only 236 kopecks. The robber is surprised that the amount at the end of the day is very small, Ling Lan adds that at this rate they will not earn anything this month. Meanwhile, Master Su is still observing his competitor's workday, his servant draws his attention to the fact that only half a day has passed and there are almost no visitors left. Su mockingly claims that this is the end of this restaurant, adding that among the people who eat in such establishments, there are only three types. The first are ordinary workers who love to watch everything around and discuss the latest news, so if somewhere they give out food for free, they will definitely come to try it. When they arrive, they will also ask for additional rice and vegetables, and when they have eaten for free, they will immediately simply leave. The second type, according to Sue, are educated people who invite their acquaintances to spend time somewhere. As a rule, they do not like to meet ordinary workers, so they will taste the food and leave. However, even they may be attracted by special elegant snacks, some gourmets will even agree to pay for additional portions. The last type, according to Master Su, are young ladies with their maids who go out into the city to do shopping, but they rarely go into places where there are so many men. His servant asks if this means the end of the restaurant, to which Master Su confirms this, adding that in this establishment people do not so much eat as they drink tea and chat. He says it looks like there are a lot of customers, but all the tables are occupied and no one is eating, and the people on the street can't wait to try Malatin. The servant enthusiastically claims that Master Su is indeed of noble blood, and he orders him to prepare more tea to observe the final ending of the restaurant. In Lu Yun's restaurant at this time, there is something like a meeting going on, where all three are trying to figure out how to improve their situation. Red Lotus is surprised and asks that if many people who come here like Malatin, then why doesn't anyone pay for additional portions? Ling Lan, in turn, points out that most people just sit and chat while drinking tea, which is why other people cannot enter the restaurant. Meanwhile, Lu Yunya says that they should not worry and everything is going according to a well-calibrated plan. The robber demands details on this plan, not really trusting initiatives of this kind, but suddenly hears a noise on the street. The merchant, having heard this fuss, orders the girls to meet the clients, they only ask in surprise who exactly he means. Suddenly, the street near Lu Yun's restaurant is full of children running happily past. These children instantly notice that it smells very tasty, one of them guesses what kind of place it is and shows it to others. Several boys try to read the name of this establishment, arguing over exactly how to pronounce what was written on the sign. Lu Yun states that the real work of today is only starting now, Lin and Lotus look at this crowd of children with great misunderstanding. The merchant opens one of the hidden cabinets, which displays numerous children's toys, instantly attracting their attention. After that, he turns to the children and says that those who order five kebabs have a chance to win a toy and asks if they want it. The children enthusiastically took out their pocket money and said loudly and almost in unison that they wanted toys. With the same enthusiasm, Lu Yun tells his workers to add vegetables and put them on the fire for further orders. Within minutes, more servings of malatin for new customers were ready and shining, slathered in the sweet and spicy sauce. And with that, Lu Yun finally sold extra portions to the children, who enthusiastically tried a new dish in this city that smelled so delicious to them. One of the boys from this crowd shouted with a raised skewer that Malatin was simply delicious, thereby encouraging his friends to buy and try. Lu Yun also encourages children to line up and quickly swoop down on the Malatin, choosing what they like best. And so these children brought a great addition to the real restaurant cash register, Ling Lan was incredibly passionate about it, while the robber asked how it even worked. Lu Yun claims that it's all about speed, probably referring to speed of thinking and adaptation to circumstances, while the girl perceived this as a physical skill, the only one that matters. Realizing this, the guy said that this was a good conclusion for a person with his lifestyle, smiling embarrassedly. Meanwhile, Ling Lan says that she seemed to understand what Lu Yun meant, remembering that now the customers in the restaurant are only drinking tea and do not want to order or go. She adds that the dishes prepared by all of them are enough to feed more than 20 people in half a day, Lotus also says that she noticed this. Meanwhile, Master Su's servant chuckles at Lu, saying that he must really be desperate if his main business target is children. Master Su himself angrily hits the servant with his fan and orders him to go with him, the same one asks if they have finished observing. The master claims that there is nothing to see here, despite the fact that he can earn five silver coins a day, if his goal is one and a half thousand a month, 
then this whole scam makes no sense. Su orders the servant to go, saying that in a month Lu Yun's restaurant will belong to him, he replies that his master is endowed with special luck. Meanwhile, in the restaurant itself, Ling Lan calculates their total profit for the day, which is 5,003 kopecks or 5 silver coins and 3 kopecks. Red Lotus recalls in surprise that the sentry from the 6th department, who once caught her, earns 5 silver for a whole working year, asking how this is possible in a day. She turns to Lu Yun, saying that it is too good to be true, and once again calls him a fraud. However, Ling Lan says that even at this rate, it's only 150 silver coins a month, and with taxes it's only a hundred, which is very little for their goal of one and a half thousand. Lu Yun tells them not to worry about the amount since it's just the first day's profit, adding that if business was that easy, everyone would be doing it, as well as promising something big tomorrow. Asked to tell the girls exactly what he has planned, the merchant tells them to better rest as tomorrow will be harder for them. Lu Yun orders them to buy five more products tomorrow morning than today, and add two pots to that. Red Lotus again asks if he is crazy and how he is going to sell so much in one single day. The night passes and the morning of a new day comes, Lu is already breathing heavily, dragging a cart of groceries to his establishment. Ling Lan also rides in this cart along with the groceries, fanning her employer to wipe away the sweat. Subsequently, they stop at the back entrance of the restaurant and the white-haired girl hands Lu Yun a small white towel. Meanwhile, Red Lotus demonstrates her unrivaled physical abilities and replenishes all large wooden basins with water, accompanied by many acrobatic feats. Lu Yun and Ling Lan enthusiastically watch this spectacular action and applaud the girl. The merchant especially praises the robber, adding that a good business can also be built from street juggling. However, with this statement, he is drained by the Red Lotus, who launches one of the basins at him and says that she is engaged in the art of kung fu and will not tolerate such comparisons. Both the merchant and his assistant were incredibly scared, so Lu tried to awkwardly change the subject by saying that it was time for them to start cooking. In a somewhat dark and resentful tone, Red Lotus asks why he can't praise her for once, Lu and Lin look at each other strangely. Lu Yun, with a slight bow, begins to list all the virtues of Lotus, calling her a real heroine and saying that he is incredibly lucky to have such a partner. However, the very next moment the merchant claims that she must hurry up to work, otherwise she will easily lose all her investments. Annoyed by this remark, the girl refuses to listen, not seeing any point in it, and tells everyone to go to work. Meanwhile, at the Su family residence, a young master stands in the middle of the courtyard and holds a bird cage in his hands, listening to it singing. Suddenly he hears his same servant calling out to him, due to which he fails to hold the cage and the drinking water for the bird is completely poured on his face. Of course, Master Su shouts at his servant, asking why he has been squealing so much since the morning. The servant says that something happened in Lu Yun's restaurant, so he hurried to tell about it, the master only irritably asks what could have happened there. To the master's surprise, the servant says that today Lu Yun's business is simply thriving, which surprises Su and gives him some thoughts. In a quiet and reserved tone, Master Su orders the servant to come with him to see what is really going on in that establishment. Meanwhile, in the restaurant itself you can see children with their parents, one of the boys assures his father that it is really very tasty here and he wants to eat something. Subsequently, this boy's father approaches Lu Yun and orders 20 portions of Malatin, like many others. Meanwhile, in the kitchen, Lotus says that the broth is almost ready and needs to add vegetables, Ling Lan hurries with a bowl full of the necessary ingredients. Lu notices that the white-haired girl can barely stand on her feet, so he says that she cannot exhaust herself like that at an early age and orders her to go and rest. He also adds that there will be a lot more work for his secretary in the future, and if she is tired, she will not be able to help. Hearing this, Ling Lan was confident and she said that she would leave and take a little rest from today's stress. After some time, Master Su himself visited the restaurant, accompanied by his servant, saying that there was something about this Lu Yong. His subordinate fearfully asks what is going on here and how the business has moved so quickly if only one day has passed. Master Su, meanwhile, said fiercely that Lu had obviously targeted children as the main audience from the very beginning and was now taking advantage of them in every possible way. If a child likes a restaurant, he asks his parents to take them there to eat there all the time, thus adding two more customers to one child, 
Sue assumes that Lu will be able to earn 20 silver coins today. The servant hears this figure and tries to calculate how much it will cost per month, but Sue immediately hears the mistake and says that it is 600 and therefore it is not even worth trying if he does not know how. The servant asks that if it is only 600, then they have nothing to worry about, but Sue states that in theory, this amount can increase, although not in an easy way. In a threatening tone, the young master says that he is going to attack and in a whisper orders the servant to make preparations for his response to Lu Yun. Master Su watches his competitor and, in a somewhat disappointed tone, states that if he allows Lu to develop, it will not be easy for him further. At the end of the second day, Ling Lan again calculates all the profits for the day and says that without change, the amount is 25 silver coins. Red Lotus is incredibly happy to hear such numbers and invites all three to divide the earned amount among themselves, dreaming of further wealth. However, Lu closes the box with the money, saying that the time has not come to divide this money yet, since according to their contract, it is Lu who decides when to return the money. Afterwards, the merchant decides to give Ling Lan her salary, saying that these two days have been quite grueling, so she deserves an advance. To this, the offended robber warns Lin that this guy is a known boilerplate and a loser, and tells her to be careful. To this she adds that she was also tired during these two days, but the attitude towards her is completely different in this establishment. However, Lu Yun had something in store for her as well, placing a strange piece of paper on the table and telling Red Lotus that it was a gift for her. The girl reacted to this as if it was some kind of trash to just get rid of or something like that, but later she takes a closer look, noticing something. Lotus instantly took the paper in her hands and saw that it was a diagram for making a throwing knife, saying that she had never seen such a variety before. Lu Yun says that he understands that Lotus is a warrior, so she is unlikely to be interested in cosmetics, so after much thought, he decided that this was the most suitable gift. When asked how he even knew this type, the guy almost gave himself away as a reborn, after which he simply said that when he was younger, he loved secret weapons. He says that he visited many masters and, after much calculation, developed a knife that was stable and dangerous at the same time. Lu Yun then quotes a poem about a knight and his sword, forged in the seventh month of the lunar calendar, and how even after death he will not be ashamed of his own heroism. Ling Lan is fascinated by the beauty of this poetry, saying that her brother said that through poetry one can get to know a person much more deeply, adding that despite the facade, Lu Yun is a noble person. Somewhat awkwardly, the merchant tries to change the subject and make everyone go to bed, warning about tomorrow's battle, which once again surprises his employees. The next day, not far from Lu Yun's establishment, a new restaurant of the Su family suddenly opens, selling different types of malatin, half the price of Lu's. Red Lotus, with more restrained anger, says that that Su is just a fraud if he set prices like that. After that, she asks Lu Yun if this is the same fight that he talked about last night and receiving an approving answer, she prepared for a physical fight. However, the merchant stops her, saying that if she does this, then they will not be able to avoid the trial, which they almost completely lose in the current circumstances. To this, Red Lotus asks what they should do in this case, if Su and his allies are obviously trying to stop them. Meanwhile, Master Su himself appears before them, mockingly saying that hard work makes you rich. Red Lotus reacts as negatively as possible to his appearance, but Lu Yun signals her to stop, and in a polite manner says that in his situation he must work even harder. Master Su says that if Lu is not busy today, then let him run to his restaurant, where the master will give him a 50% discount. Suddenly, Red Lotus interrupts him by throwing a sharp skewer at the guy's forehead, to which he asks what she's even doing, adding that it's illegal to hit people. The robber threatens to beat Master Su if he comes to them again, and he tells Lu to keep an eye on his people, threatening them with prison. Hearing such a threat, Lotus intended to rush out again, but was restrained by Lu Yun and continued to shout about this situation. However, suddenly the merchant whispers something in her ear, shocking the girl with his foresight and then adding that if he were so easy to defeat, he would have betrayed her long ago. Ling Lan meanwhile asks what they should do next, to which Lu replies that they should only wait. 